Well, happy Easter weekend, Grace, and welcome to all of you who are joining with us. My name is Chris Pedro, the online campus pastor here at our church, and it is so good to see you here with us this weekend. And hey, no matter where you are tuning in from today, we all get to come together to join with the saints of old and proclaim that He is risen. So I hope that you are excited and ready to join with the Grace Worship team as we lift up the name of Jesus, and then we'll receive another amazing teaching from our very own Dr. Chip Bennett. Now for you, our online online community who are watching live, I want to invite you to do more than just spectate this Easter weekend. Instead, I'm inviting you to participate with us during today's service. One way that you can do that is by opening up the YouTube chat and fellowshipping with others who are watching live. See, we believe that church isn't something to just be observed, but it's a communal tradition where we get to join together and interact with each other. So feel free to greet one another, give an amen, share an emoji of hands in the air, you name it but please do get involved in the chat this weekend. And then the other thing that you can do is you can share today's worship experience with your friends and family. It's not too late to invite someone to church, and someone that you know, and it couldn't be any easier to invite someone online. So all you have to do is hit that share button just below this video, copy the link, and paste it anywhere. Paste it on social media, send it out in a text message, or in an email, whatever we can do to get the word out. Because here's the thing, here at Grace, we wanna do whatever we can to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So would you take a quick moment to do that? You never really know whose life could be changed forever just by sending them a link. And the last thing that I want to do is give a really big shout out to any of you who are tuning in as a new guest today. We are so glad that you're here and we would love to connect with you. If you would, we ask that you take a moment to visit our website, gracesarasota.com and click the I'm new here button or use your phone to text the phrase new guest SRQ to 9700. Doing either of those things will bring you to our digital connect card, which is just a simple way for us to connect with you, to be praying for you, and then this also send you a free gift. Plus, you'll also be able to plan a future visit to either of our physical campuses. So please do check it out, but just know that from all of us here at Grace, we are thrilled to have you here this weekend, so welcome. Having said all that, I hope that you're ready to worship with us, but before we jump into singing, we've got a short video that I'm sure will be a blessing to you as we prepare our minds and our hearts to worship Jesus. But just know, from all of us here at our church, thanks for being here and welcome to Grace. Hands and feet pierced. The body laid in the tomb, beaten to the point of exhaustion. Guarded by soldiers, a large stone separated humanity from Christ once again. The one who is pure and blameless was accused of blasphemy betrayed into the hands of wicked men by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. Wearing a crown of thorns, crucified on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He who knew no sin took on the sin of us all. He muttered his last words saying, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What now? The one whom the disciples followed, who raised the dead to life, worked mighty miracles. Had now shamefully been put to death. All hope felt lost. Three days later, with tears on their cheeks, some women approached the tomb where his body laid, only to find the stone rolled away. An angel appeared to them saying, don't be afraid. For I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Christ appeared to the disciples in Galilee in flesh and bones. Astonished, they touched his skin and the marks on his hands and feet. Knowing for a fact that this is the risen King. Jesus proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have eternal life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. In God's great, abundant mercy, He has caused us to be born again into a living hope because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You may be asking, is it really true? Yes, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
this wonderful cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Oh yeah, I believe in signs and wonders Oh, I have resurrection power Yes I do story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony come together sons and daughters
grave church come on yeah well happy easter weekend and welcome to grace community church you guys can have a quick seat for a minute my name is jeff gaston and i am your campus connection pastor here at the ranch and one of the very first things we love to do at the beginning of each service is to recognize and celebrate some very special people and that would be all of our new guests that are joining us here and online. So come on, Grace. Y'all know what to do. Let's give them a big heartfelt welcome. Yeah. That's right. Yes, sir. We are glad you're here. We're excited to see you, and we would love to get to know you, and we've got a few ways we do that. One is through our digital connect card, and you can go to our website, gracesarasota.com. Go to the homepage there. Find the I'm New Here button. Click on that. That'll take you to it. And also, you can text the phrase "New Guest SRQ" to nine seven zero zero zero, and we'll have a copy of that sent right to your mobile device. And as an added bonus, if you're here with us live tonight, you can go check out our welcome area just outside the front entrance here to the left on your way out. Go out there and meet our welcome team. Introduce yourself. We would love to get to know you, and we've also got a gift bag waiting there for you as well. It's just our way of saying thank you so much for spending a part of your Easter weekend here with us. So, Grace, as we prepare our hearts to move back into worship, I just want to take a moment and thank you so much for your generosity. I mean, truly, it's your generous hearts that allow us to do the things that we're called to do in this community and beyond. You and the generosity that you have help us fulfill the mission of Grace Community Church. So thank you for that. And if you would like to partner with us in that generosity journey, you can do it in many ways. They're all listed behind me here on the back of the screen. And so we'd like to take a moment and lift up the offering that we're going to receive this week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer with that. Father God, I just thank you so much for what this weekend means. I thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here and worship the most generous, greatest gift of all, your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you so much for everything you've blessed us with. 
Lord, we pray for our giving this week, God. We pray that you would bless that, that you would multiply that, and that you would guide and direct us in stewarding it wisely, Lord, so that we can truly be that church that reaches the unchurched by being intentional neighbors that reflect the love of your son. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we worship your holy name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand and worship.
When I was 20, uh, I was in a car accident. Um, we were going um, in excess of 170 miles per hour on Honoré, and my arm got caught between the tree and the car, and it pulled my arm uh, so far that it ripped my artery in half. Uh, I lost three pints of blood into my shoulder, and then it shredded my nerves from shoulder to fingertip. After 10 years of marriage, I learned that our relationship um, was largely a lie and my spouse had been unfaithful for a large portion of our relationship. I was going through a really rough patch. I uh, was really struggling with work. I was having difficulty paying my bills. I was having difficulty getting through the day, making ends meet, making, keeping up with my commitments and keeping up with my relationship with other people. And I felt like I was letting everyone around me down constantly. Without the accident, I, I wouldn't be who I am today, uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have come to grace. When I'm at my lowest, when I can't see any hope, any way out, or why my life went down in these shambles, God used song, scripture, other people, prayer, messages to encourage my heart and help me keep the faith and and keep pressing forward and leaning into Him. That God is taking this and turning it into something new and something beautiful. And though we're having to deal with the pain and the hurt now, to know that through this, we can speak life into other people and show that there is not just one face of God that people see and they expect in the sunshine and rainbows, but that God is still right there next to you in the deepest valleys and in the storm that He's holding onto you that you can hold on to him. It is true that I was hopeless and suicidal, but now I'm, I'm filled with hope and blessing through Christ in me. It really is true that God is in the business of redeeming and restoring each and every one of us, not just the characters from the Bible, but for me and for you. It is true that I was lost and broken, but through Christ's love, I'm found. Amen, right? I just want to take one second and say, isn't it great that we can actually have Easter services this year in church? Amen. <laughs> Nothing against those who are online. We want you to be there. It's not, I just, I'm just happy that we can gather together because uh, it's great. You know, um, I'm going to be a moment here of just transparency because you might not think that pastors would ever say this, but um, of all the weekends of, of the year, there's 52, I'm sure you know that, but uh, um, of the 52, th the one that is the most difficult for me to put something together is Easter weekend, Resurrection weekend. And you may go, what do you mean? It's like the Super Bowl for Christians, you know? I mean, it's resurrection, newness of life. Totally get that. And, and I understand how you probably see it that way. I would just say, come over here on my side of the fence for just a second and realize this, that 51 weeks out of every year, about 95%, and we're a growing church, so maybe there's three, five, seven percent, whatever it is, but about 95% of everybody that comes in here, 51 weeks out of every year, they know who I am, they know our band, you know how to get in here, you know where the restrooms are, you know what we do, you know why we do what we do. And of course, on every one of those weekends, you have some people that are new and whatever else, but typically I get to come in here and I know most of the people that are here. In fact, most of you know this, I know many of you by name and, and, and I've, I've prayed with you or I've talked with you or I've emailed with you. And, and so I know you and you sort of know what to expect and I know what to expect and we sort of just grow together in our relationship with the Lord. But one weekend out of every year, especially at a church, our size, 20%, 30%, 35% at times of the people are brand new. 
never been here before and they come in for all kinds of different reasons. Maybe they got a flyer in the mail and they thought, you know what, maybe I should just go back to church uh, this weekend. Some of you made a promise with your grandmother or maybe with your aunt or maybe with your mom or your dad that every Easter you would come back and you would be a part of something and maybe this year you chose this church rather than another church or, or maybe you came in because you just thought, you know, I know somebody or you're visiting or for whatever reason, but here's what I know and this is what makes it challenging to do what I do because I want to encourage all the believers that are here, but I know this, and it may just be one, but I suspect that it's more than one, that in every single Easter service, there's someone that if they could get 20 minutes with me and sit across the table, this is what they would say to me. They would say, Chip, why should I even consider being a follower of Jesus? Because come on, Chip, you know, there's no way in the world all those animals fit in that boat. Lord, you know, Chip, you know that there's no way that we, anybody could believe the Bible. I mean, that thing was a bunch of people, all kinds of transmission, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of errors. I mean, come on. And some of you all, come on, Chip, look at what the church has done in history. You guys haven't really been that great followers of Jesus. Some of you would say, Chip, you have no idea. I grew up in church and I tried to believe and I'm out. And some of you might even go as far to say that, Chip, you don't really understand where I'm at because when I grew up as a little child, things happened to me that I can't tell anybody. And you know what? I want you to know something. If that's you, I get it. I get your questions. I get your doubts. I've been there too. And I want you to know something. You're at a very safe place. You're at a place that you can belong here before you believe. But I do wanna take the next 20 or 30 minutes. And what I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you. I want you to believe that if we were across from a table with some coffee, and it would be Dunkin' Donuts because I don't like Starbucks. Um, it's bitter and too expensive. I'm, I'm just a blue collar dude. I like Dunkin' Donuts. And $2.45 starts my morning every single morning. True story. I go through there all the time. My kids will go through and they'll be like, hey, Chip. And they're like, they know you at Dunkin' Donuts? I'm like, I go here every single day to Dunkin' Donuts. True story today. True story. I drive in the, up to the drive through I went on Fruitville. Voice comes over the thing we're sorry right now, we can't do any orders because our computer's down. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's okay. Chip? I'm like, yeah. They're like, it's on us. Come on up and get your coffee. I'm like, yes. I'm like, yes. I'm like, I, I even called my dad. I'm like, today is going to be a good day. You know, but, but, but I say that if, if you and me were sitting across from a table, and I hope that this will encourage you that are believers, but if it was just you and me, and you'd ask me, why should I even consider being a follower of Jesus. What I would say is, let's put the Bible aside. We'll put it here on the table because you probably don't believe that the Bible is, is the word of God. I get that. Let me put away all my Christianese. Let me put all that aside and let's just have a conversation because I would like to tell you why I think you should consider being a follower of Jesus. And I wanna be up front because I'm an upfront guy. At the end, I'm gonna ask you, would you reconsider? Would you reconsider being a follower of Jesus? But this is what I would say if we were talking. I would say, well, <clears throat> you read history? Yeah I, yeah, I read history. Okay, well, history's history. You know, and so let's talk a little about history. Let's talk about the way we process things. We know how we process things. We, we read stuff. We, we, we sort of bring it in. We look at what sort of things are, and we make a decision. That's called logical probability. We, we would love to have logical certainty on everything, but unfortunately we can't. You can't even have logical certainty that your wife or your husband loves you. You have logical probability based on what you see, based on what you've examined. You can't tell your kid if he has a stomach ache that he, with the logical certainty that he has a stomach ache. It's logical probability. You look at everything and you go, he's got a stomach ache. Well, let's start with history. Let's start with history and let's talk a little bit about how we can go back into the first century we can talk a little bit about what was going on and we talk about things that everybody, whether somebody's a liberal or a conservative or whether somebody's a believer or not a believer, but if you put a scholarly panel together, every single person that has studied the first century would know this about Jewish people. They would know that every single one of them believed they were special. 
They believed that God had chosen them to be a nation to bless other nations. And although they had many different ways of being Jewish, some were Sadducees, some were Pharisees, some were Essenes, some were Zealots, all of them though had what we call a Jewish messianic expectation. They believed that in the way it was in history for them, that Moses had delivered them from Egypt, had delivered them from oppression and bondage. And even though they didn't do very well and they didn't follow God and they ended up in captivity, they believed that one day God would send a Messiah. And this Messiah would one day come and liberate God's people. There's no question that is historically a fact. The Jewish people were looking for messiahs. In fact, we know this to be true. We know that before Jesus ever came, there were all kinds of people that claimed to be the messiah. And we know that after Jesus came, there were all kinds of people that claimed to be the messiah. Even until 126 AD, Simon Bar Kokhba led a rebellion against Rome because he said he was the messiah. They even minted coins with his face on it because they believed that he would be their deliverer. And what we know for a fact is although they believed God would send a Messiah, there was one thing that was universal that they knew to be true and nobody doubted it, that a dead Messiah was a failed Messiah, period, end of story. Because there's no way that a Messiah who died could be the one that liberated them from the Roman oppression and you were even doubly a failure if you were killed by the Romans that you were trying to liberate Israel from everybody knows this to be true if somebody was following a messiah and the messiah died it was automatically unfollow Instagram unfollow Facebook, put thumbs down on YouTube. Nobody said, hey, let's gather together. Let's come together and let's try to figure out how we can sort of keep the band together following. No, if you died or you were killed, all hope was gone. Everything was done. Time to move on. And there's no question about that whatsoever. That is the way it was. And even in scripture that I'm not trying to tell you you need to believe right now or anything like that, the scriptures even show that, that feeling because we have two disciples that have come to Jerusalem to see Jesus because they think he's the Messiah. And what happens? He dies. So what happens? They unfollow. They're done. In fact, they say that our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped I mean, he died. He wasn't in. We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. And you could go through text after text that are not in the Bible of people that would have said the same thing about the Messiah that they followed. He died. We put our hope in him. But now that he's dead, on to something else because he surely wasn't the Messiah. So I'm gonna ask you a question. And I'm gonna ask you this question a number of times. And you don't need to give me an answer right now. I just want you to think through it. I want you to hear this. There's no reason within the first century Jewish culture for anyone to follow Jesus after his death. So here's your question that you're gonna get over and over and over again. And it's this. What is the most plausible explanation? What happened? What did they see? What experience changed them? What's the most plausible explanation for why people still followed Jesus after he died? Let's continue the conversation. Roman crucifixion. You've probably seen crosses. You've probably heard about crucifixion. You probably, that's nothing new to you. Well, the Romans knew something. The Romans knew that they were in control. That, that, they, that they ruled and they knew that if a sect would sort of in the, in the sort of the remote part of the empire sort of got together or some militias got together and people started to galvanize around that and started to you know, decide to up, 
rise and whatever, they knew how to deal with those would-be upstart political and all kinds of problems and militias and everything. They knew how to deal with it. And the way they dealt with it is they killed them. They killed them by putting them on a cross. And they said, this is your leader? This is the one that's going to overthrow us? This is your sectarian leader, your military leader? See, what we know for sure is that Rome knew how to deal with ambitious, would-be political and religious challengers to its throne. And they knew what the Jewish people believed. And as soon as they got a sniff of someone who thought they might be the Messiah, they wanted to make sure that they put them up on a cross so that all their followers could see, here's your leader. You think he's gonna overthrow us? Watch him die over hours. Watch him gurgle in the blood in his lungs of asphyxiation so that you can know there's not going to be someone that's going to overthrow our power. And just by the way, to somehow believe that Jesus didn't die, to somehow believe that, you know, well, you know, maybe, maybe he was hung on the cross for a little bit and they thought he was dead, you know, and then they maybe got, brought him down, they put him on a cold stone and all of a sudden he woke up and everybody was like, whoa, this is really cool. Maybe, maybe whatever. Let, let me tell you something. If, if, if there's anything I can tell you with certainty is that the Romans knew how to kill people. They knew how to make them dead. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What's the most plausible explanation for why people who believed when a Messiah died, they were a failure, followed not just a dead Messiah, but followed a Messiah that was killed by the hands of Rome? Let's continue. We know for a fact about the early documented spread and the persecution of Christianity. There's no question. There's no question that Christianity spread like crazy. Like, how did it spread? Like, what got into them? Nobody ever said, man, the guy died. Let's just, let's just roll with it, man. Let's just you know, I don't know, I'm sort of getting tired of all these failed messiahs. Let's just pick one here that died and maybe act like he was it. Maybe the whole messiah thing was different than we thought it was going to be. Sounds like a plan. Does it sound like a good plan? Sure, it sounds like a plan. Let's go tell everybody that. Hey, you know the guy that died? Yeah, man, let's follow him. No, but Christianity spread like crazy. Like within just a few years these people that were following a dead person that was a failed Messiah that was crucified by Rome that supposedly he was going to liberate Israel from decided to spread this story about this guy through the empire that within just a few short years it had spread all the way to Rome by the thousands in 49, Festus wanted to get rid of a bunch of Christians because he was bothered with them in Rome. That's 17, 16 years. How in the world in that short of time when there was no TV, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram, there was no anything. How in the world did this thing spread that a dead, failed Messiah, everybody should believe, and not only believe, but were willing to die for this person. What happened? What did they experience? What did they see? What went on? We know in the early 60s, there was a man named Nero. And if you've never been to church at all, you probably know who Nero was. And you just know he wasn't a good guy. He was a beauty of a man. Nero was the man. He ruled it all, he was the emperor. He didn't like a section of Rome, so you know what he did? He burnt it down. But what happened was, is the people started realizing that he was the one that had burnt it down. 
And no pun intended, but the political heat started to get a little hot back at Nero's place. And so you know what he did? He blamed it on Christians because there were thousands of them in Rome. And he killed them. And they died for a failed, dead, would-be Messiah. And you go, I mean, how, how do you know that? Well, we know that because Tacitus, who was a Roman historian who hated Christians, who didn't believe in Jesus at all, thought it was terrible. Tacitus, in his book, Annals, says this. Consequently, to get rid of the report that Nero had burned it down, which he did, he fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. This isn't the Bible, this isn't Christianese, this is just history. And not only do we know that, but he also says this, he says, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So, what's the most plausible explanation of why Christianity spread like it did and why people died for a dead man. What happened? What went on? Nobody else followed a dead Messiah. How in the world did this thing spread? What went on? Why did they believe this? Let's do a little recap. Nobody would continue to follow a dead Messiah period, end of story. That's not me giving you wishful thinking. That's not me like trying to do Jedi mind tricks to get you to sort of think about becoming a Christian. This is just the way it is. People did not follow a dead Messiah. On top of that, Rome knew how to kill people. Jesus was dead. But Christianity spread in large numbers and people were willing to die for it. What? is the most plausible explanation that explains how a failed, dead, crucified man secured so many followers that were willing to die for him. The best explanation, the most probable explanation, the one that makes the most sense is that they actually saw a dead man walking. They saw someone who had died alive. You don't read the story where they were like, oh, you know what, man, I know, you know Jesus died. We really think he's gonna get up, man. So you, you don't read like that, you know, on, on the resurrection morning, you know, they're like, you know, there with the clock. Okay, 10, 9, 8, you know, roll the stone away, 7, because he's gonna come out. No, th- none of that. Like, what happened? Like, how did this go on? Well, the most plausible explanation is that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now, I know you're going to say, oh, whoa, 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 hold on now, Chip. Don't get too crazy here. Take a sip of that Dunkin' Donuts. Everybody knows that the early church made up this story. Come on now. You know that they made it up. They, they, I, I, know, I know it sounds good and what you said sounds good, but, but, but really the early church, I mean, they, they sort of made this thing up, okay? Well, since you say that, let's look at the story that they made up because this is the story that they told. Let's read it. When he rose, Jesus, early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. I'm just gonna tell you something. Maybe you don't know this. Maybe you're not aware of this. Maybe you haven't read enough, but I can tell you one thing. In the first century, there was a gender that their testimony meant nothing. And it was a woman. Not only did women's testimony receive no merit from anybody, but this woman had a past. 
fact, if you're going to make the story up, you would not have chosen a woman because nobody would have believed the story. In fact, we know that nobody would believe the story because Jesus' own followers that walked with Mary Magdalene, that knew Mary Magdalene, that had seen Mary Magdalene have a transformation in her life. And just two verses after this one, it says that when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they didn't believe it. Why? Because nobody believed a woman. So if you say, well, the early church made this story up, what I, what I can tell you for a fact is this. Nobody in the first century that was in their right mind would have a woman be the first witness to the resurrection. Unless she actually was the first witness to the resurrection. Like, the first preachers of the gospel were women. The first ones to instruct the men were women. That doesn't even go over in most churches today. How about this? You want to make up a good story? How about having a half-brother whose name was James? James not only came to believe that his half-brother that he grew up with had risen from the dead and was now God and realized that he was God. He died for it. Think about this. What would it take for your own brother to think that you were God? What would have to happen? What would you have to see to go, yeah, my brother is God and I'm willing to die for it. You go, well, okay, you know what? But okay, hold on. Before I start to really consider this, let's, let's be honest here. People in the first century were more gullible. Like they, they didn't have the science. They didn't have the data that we have. I mean, they believed crazy stuff. You know, they didn't have all the facts that we have. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have all these great things because, you know, I've watched Netflix and nobody would ever put anything on Netflix that was bad because Netflix is just really good quality stuff. You know, all that good stuff. The, the, the bottom line is, is these people were more gullible. Okay. Paul, when he preaches to the Athenian Greek philosophers at the Areopagus in Acts 17. He ends his message with, and Jesus rose from the dead. How'd those gullible people respond? It says when they heard of the resurrection, they mocked it. Why? Because they were no different than us. It wasn't like they buried people on a regular basis and then that person came back. You won't believe it. Uncle John? Yeah. Remember a month ago we buried him? He's back. He's out on the farm. He's planting corn. No, they knew. They knew what we know. Dead people don't get up. You and me can go to a cemetery and watch all day. There's a really good chance nobody's coming out of that grave. Say, so, okay, 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 okay. Here's what it is. This is the reason, Chip. Look, the church, many, many years after Jesus, the person, was long gone and forgotten by most, they made up the resurrection. Come on, Chip. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, you know, the gospels are like so old and they're like 100 years after, you know, Jesus died. And so that they're 100 years after Jesus died. And then, you know, it gave them a long time to sort of forget about Jesus. And then they came up with this new thing and everything else. First of all, that's not true. The gospels were not written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus's death. Every one of the gospels was written before 70 AD, but that's not really important. What's really important is this. There's a guy named Paul that wrote an epistle to the Corinthian church, roughly about 20 years after Jesus' death. And nobody, when I say nobody, nobody disputes whether or not Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. They may be disputes about whether he wrote Ephesians. 
And there may be disputes of whether he wrote 2 Thessalonians. And there may be disputes on all kinds of other stuff. But nobody, it doesn't make a difference what they, what belief systems, where they come from. If they are a scholar of the first century, everybody knows that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. What was Paul preaching? Not long after Jesus had died. In fact, enough to be able to get into the world, to plant churches, and then to come back later and write a letter. Early, early, early on, what was the message of the church? The message of the church was simple. Paul, in fact, said, if this message isn't true, then all of it's wrong. Moses could have crossed the Red Sea, all the animals could have got on the boat, but if this didn't happen, none of that matters. It's the one thing that everything hangs on, everything that we talk about Christianity is about this. He said, I taught you of first importance that Jesus had risen from the dead. He says, in fact, he appeared to Cephas and to the 12. Not only that, but he appeared to 500 people at one time. And most of them, they're still alive. Like you can go talk to them. They saw him. Like you need to go talk to them. We're not that far away. Some of them have died. We had a little bit of time away here, but most of these people are still alive. You can go talk to them. They saw the dead man walking. Not only that, he also appeared to James, his half brother that was born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus. James saw his brother who had died by crucifixion walking. and to all the apostles. And he also appeared to me. So listen to me. Of all the things that I could sit here and tell you, has the church done some things bad? Absolutely. Are there some problems in the Bible? Absolutely. Are there some things that stump me still and I teach theology? Absolutely. Are the things that people have done in the name of Jesus that are wrong? Absolutely. But I can tell you this, Christianity does not hang on anything other than one thing. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he is a failed, dead Messiah. And I can tell you this, without feeling like I'm being intellect, without, I'm not being intellectually dishonest. I'm not stretching something. I'm not making something up. I can tell you this, that the most plausible reason to best explain why we do what we do, why we gather, why people have believed in Jesus, why people died for Jesus, why people still gather in churches, why we still build churches, why this goes on. The most plausible explanation is the historical event that we celebrate on this weekend. And that is the resurrection that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, we're sitting across the table. There's something I believe about you. I believe that if you were at a bridge and the bridge was out and it had fallen down because of an earthquake or whatever, I believe that you would stand there on that bridge until you physically could not do any more, telling people, don't keep driving you're gonna careen over that bridge. I believe that you, if I was in a boat going down a river and you knew there was a waterfall, I believe you would grab me and say, stop, don't keep going. I believe that if you found something in your life that made a difference for you, I believe you'd wanna tell me. Which is why 
I want you to stop for a moment and ask, what is the most plausible explanation for why any of this happens? And I know people in the name of God and people who are Christians, they, they, they lead with everything else. They try to argue the Bible to you and politics and all kinds of other stuff. I get it. They're wrong. The message of Christianity is not whether Adam had a belly button. The message of Christianity is not how many animals could actually get on this ark and would the ark actually float. The message of Christianity is not how old the world is. The message of Christianity is very simple. There was a man named Jesus who lived and he died and under any normal expectation and experience, everybody would have moved on. But for some reason, they didn't. And they started talking about this man and they gave their life for this man. And I'm here to tell you the most plausible reason for that, the most logically probable situation that we can come up with is that that man got up from the grave on the third day. Now, if that's true, I don't want you to go over the bridge. I don't want you to hit the waterfall. I want you to have eternal life because Jesus came to die for you and me. And he rose again on the third day. And even though there's a lot of things I may not be able to answer, and there's a lot of questions I still have. If he rose from the dead, then it is game on. He was who he said he was, and that's all that matters. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. He is the one that came and died for your and I's sins. And whether you're here or whether you're online. And online, we have a telephone number that you can call if you want to. But I told you, I want you to reconsider following Jesus. I want you to reconsider what that would mean for you in your life to follow him. And I know it's scary. I know it's scary to like go, whoa, man, hold on. I'm gonna have to say, you know, I've, but man, I, I need Jesus in my life. That means I'm like gonna have to turn my life over to him. That means, whoa, man, that might be, whew, that's, I get it. But the reality is, I can't stand here in the middle of Lakewood Ranch and not tell you, hey, don't go over that bridge. Don't walk out of here without considering Jesus. And before I give you that chance, I wanna tell you one last story. And this is from the Bible. And whether you're a believer or not at this point, I want you to listen to this story because it's gonna speak to both. So Jesus, had his disciples and they were fishermen and they were good at what they did. Jesus was not a fisherman. Jesus had come to the Sea of Galilee and there was a crowd gathering around him because people wanted to hear what he had to say and because he healed people. The disciples came in from a long night of fishing and they knew what they were doing. They knew how to fish. They knew where to go. They knew where to cast their nets in the Sea of Galilee. It's not that big of a, of a it's not really a sea, it's like a lake. They roll in and all they want to do is get their nets cleaned and go to bed. They roll in and Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to use your boats here to do a sermon. You can imagine they're like going, oh man, that's fine. Use the boat. It's okay. Preaches a message. And then he says, hey guys, let's go fishing. They're like, oh, man, he's got these great stories, but he knows nothing about fishing. We don't go fishing during the day. We fish at night. We know all about fishing. This man knows nothing about fishing. So when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, hey, I want you to put out in the deep and I want you to go let your nets down again. <laughs> like, you gotta be kidding me. The Bible's real. Because it 
He doesn't have any heroes in the disciples. If you can write a story, he at least had a hero. None of them were heroes. Listen to what Luke tells us. Simon said, Master, man, we have toiled all whole night and took nothing. Like, we, like we're we fishermen. You're like a carpenter. It's different. You got good messages. We know how to fish. We toiled all night and we caught nothing. But at your word, we'll let down the nets. And they go out into the same lake. They throw their nets in the same place. And all of a sudden their nets are breaking because there's fish everywhere. <clears throat> Why is that important? It's important because many of you have been toiling in the same place for years and you have nothing to show for it. You've been trying to figure out how to make your marriage work. You've been trying to figure out how to make your life work. You've been trying to deal with your depression. You've been trying to deal with family issues and you've toiled and you have nothing. I'm here to tell you there is a man that rose again on the third day that can take you right to the place that you have toiled and he can do the miraculous. He can bring things back. He can restore. He can catch fish where you didn't catch fish because he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you're a believer on this resurrection weekend, maybe you need to let Jesus take you out where you've been toiling and let him do what he does. But I wanna to talk to you that are across the table from me. Why would I consider to be a follower of Jesus? I would say to you, why would you not wanna be a follower of Jesus? And I wanna give you on, online and you here a chance to make that happen. I'm not gonna pressure you. I'm not gonna push you. I'm not gonna make it uncomfortable for you. I'm just gonna do this here. If you would, would please, out of respect for everybody here, would everybody just put their head down and shut their eyes, don't look around, don't make anybody uncomfortable. I just wanna ask you, if, if you're here and you're like, you know what, I do wanna know, I do wanna settle eternity. You know, I really should consider being a follower of Jesus. If that's you, I'm not gonna embarrass you in any way. I'm just gonna ask you to do one thing and that's it. Would you just, for just a second, would you just say, hey, that's, that's me. I, you know what, I, 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 wanna, I wanna deal with some things. Would you just put your hand in the air for a second and just say, hey, that's me, Chip. I, I wanna know that I can settle eternity once and for all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. If you did, I just want you at your seat to take a moment. And you don't have to say it like this, but say something like this. Say, Jesus, I'm here. And I didn't know why I would maybe consider being a follower, but for whatever reason, something is arresting my heart. There's something... Maybe I was supposed to be here. Maybe this, I'm not here by accident. Maybe I'm here for a reason, which is to follow you and to meet you. And Lord, what I'm hearing is, is that you rose from the dead, which means you died for my sins. And I want you to forgive them. And I believe that you rose from the dead because I wanna have eternal life. If that's you, just have that moment with him right now and say, Jesus, making the big U-turn. I've been doing life my way. I've been living life my way. But I'm turning towards you right now because I want to follow you. If you prayed that prayer, you're online right now. You can go onto a phone and make a phone call and somebody will answer that phone and they will pray with you. If you did that, would you please, nobody wants to embarrass you, but would you please let somebody with a, 
intentional neighbor shirt on, a blue shirt, or somebody that's a pastor on the staff, or somebody that you think is a staff member, would you just let them, hey, you know what, I made a commitment tonight. And the reason is, is because we wanna help you make those next steps. We'd also like to talk to you at some point about baptism and our following of Jesus. But I want you to know that you have made the best decision that you could ever make in following Jesus. And so right now, we're gonna take a moment, we're gonna stand. The worship band is gonna lead us in one last final song. And I can tell you it's a powerful song and it's a song that's gonna really speak to you. And I just want you, whether you're a believer or you just became a believer, I just want you to take a moment and really have a moment with God because Jesus has risen. He has risen indeed. Would you stand with us and would you sing with us?
in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our god has robbed the Grace, I hope you believe that today, that the same resurrection power of Christ lives in you and me for those who have chosen to believe in the name of Jesus. Now, if you've never made that decision for Christ before and you would like to, or if you feel like God has been tugging on your heart during service, I want to once more extend that invitation to you. The God of this universe came in the form of man and has taken on our sins and has overcome death. He now offers us this free gift and all you have to do is accept it. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you can pray that prayer of salvation from wherever you are right now, or if you'd like to talk to someone, you can email grace at gracesarasota.com or simply call the number at the bottom of the screen. We really would love to help you cross the finish line of faith. Now, if you did make that decision for Christ today, welcome home. We are cheering for you as you have made that decision and we want you to know that we are here for you too. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us as we would love to help you in your faith walk as well. And I also just want to remind anyone who is a new guest today, we really are so glad that you've spent some of your weekend with us. We'd love to connect with you by asking you to please visit gracesarasota.com and click the I'm new here button or text new guest SRQ to 97000. Doing so will allow for you to plan a future visit to either of our physical campuses. Plus, you'll also be able to fill out our digital connect card and receive a free gift from our church. Listen, everyone, we love you. It's always so great to see you here online. And thanks for worshiping with us, for chatting with us, and for being a part of our church family. Now it's time to go out and be intentional neighbors who reflect Christ. Have an awesome holiday weekend. And as always, thanks for joining us here at Grace, where everyone is welcome.